Architects of Imagination, a game dev podcast where we talk to the brilliant minds behind your favorite video games. And before uh, I introduce my guest today, um, I want to, uh, another of my passions that, that I haven't really gotten into much on this podcast since it's focused on video games uh, is Dungeons and Dragons. It's something that I've played since I was a kid, maybe nine years old. Um, I currently have uh, an OD&D game running with 1974 rules. Um, this is my Dungeons and Dragons room at the house that I built during COVID. <laughs> so uh, saying that, it is with great pleasure that I announce today's guest, Mr. Lawrence Schick. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Lawrence Schick. I'm a longtime uh, game designer and writer. Um, and uh, as uh, as David says, uh, I, I started out with Dungeons and Dragons uh, back when Dungeons and Dragons started out. Uh, in fact, I started playing when OD and D first appeared, uh, and uh, began working on the game uh, uh, five years later, um, and have worked on role playing games, uh, tabletop, and video games uh, ever since. Mostly video games uh, in the last forty years, um, but uh, and mostly narrative games. Uh, uh, in the video game space. Yeah, and so you were you were an author of one of the early uh, Dungeons and Dragons modules that still makes to this day best ten of all time lists. White Plume Mountain. Uh, you were involved in the original Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, Deities and Demigods, and Fiend Folio, um, and then bounced over to to video games at ColecoVision in 1982. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, and it worked in uh, various um, video game studios uh, on and off ever since. Awesome, awesome. Including, I, I noticed in your uh, Moby games, a, a favorite teenage game of mine, Pirates, uh, for the C64. That was a phenomenal game. Um, and I have you on today because we're going to mostly talk about uh, Baldur's Gate 3, for which you were the principal narrative designer at Larian. Indeed. Uh, so, so first... A massive congrats to to you to the whole team at Larian on this this quite incredible achievement in a video game, uh, and and congrats to me and all the other <laughs> players that get to enjoy it. I've got two sessions running right now, uh, a solo one on my computer, and then I'm playing with my my kid out of LA, uh, and it, it is such a tremendous game. So yeah, congratulations on all the success that you guys have had with Baldur's Gate three. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I play with my kids too. And of course, um, it's, you know, like all the best RPGs, it's it's a collaborative game. Um, so it doesn't exist without the contributions of the players. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, uh, thankful every day that uh, our community is so strong and has worked with us so closely. And and you guys just cleaned up uh, in the awards this, this year. You you swept the, the game awards, the golden joysticks, the BAFTAs. Uh, and and well deserved in my mind. It is it is it is an accomplishment. I think we've had great RPGs over over the years, but uh, this one is just outstanding. So yeah, am amazing work by you guys. Thank you. Let me point out, we haven't swept the Baftas yet. That's next month. Okay, um, is that next month? Last night we we took uh, we took some more uh, awards um, at uh, uh, the at GDC at the Game Developers Conference. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So they're, they're still trickling in. That's right. The, the BAFTAs are, are nominations at this point. So yeah, good, good luck. Good luck with that next year. Um, talk about how much, how much writing goes into a game like Baldur's Gate compared to say like a novel or, or a film. It, it, there are a lot of words and there's a lot of time, you know, to even play through the game. It's gotta be. Okay. So, yes. So, you know, I, I write books too. So I'm familiar, you know, intimately familiar with what it takes to do serial media. Uh, as well as interactive media. And uh, let me tell you um, that uh, the difference is there are orders of magnitude more uh, story uh, in a, a game like uh, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, than in a novel um, because we have to provide for uh, everything that we think the player is going to want to do uh, because our the maxim here, you know, is uh, uh, player choice. And uh, if the players would want to do it, we should see if we could give it to them. We should see if we can help them do it. Um, uh, it's And uh, so 
Yeah, and in insofar as everything is voiced and mocapped as well um, for dialogue, uh, that's a, uh, a, a tremendous undertaking, um, and it requires, uh, you know, uh, a dozen and a half writers uh, for several years, uh, and then all of the other people who work with them, hundreds more, uh, uh, to uh, to make it all uh, come alive, um, and so yeah, it's uh, and it's. You know, none of it is machine created either. It's every single thing in <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3 is handcrafted. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it takes a huge investment of uh, time and dedication by many, many talented and very uh, passionate people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll just ramble on for a second. There's no... There's no magic to building a, a really big RPG. It's just dedication. You build it layer by layer by layer. It's like Japanese lacquerware. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, make, you make the basic shape of it. Um, and then you add reactivity and you add um, uh, all, all different kinds of uh, 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 potential uh, occurrences and, uh, and uh, you add side comments and uh, uh, every place where the player would probably want to interact with something, you, you give them something to say, something to hear, you know, so uh, we got a narrator uh, for that. So um, we can, uh, we can give you a vocalized uh, dialogue, um, even if you're not talking to somebody. So um, in as much as this is based on Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you got to have uh, an analog to the uh, to the game master, the dungeon master. Yeah, and 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 like pre-write every damn thing <laughs> that could possibly happen. It, it it really shines through too. It just like you guys spared no expense. It would seem. Every is it like pretty much every single animal <laughs> in the whole game, like the rats that are around. Like you can talk to pretty much any any creature out there. Uh, uh, yes, some of them don't have very much to say, um, yeah. but. Uh, but if you've got uh, speak with animals going, um, which I recommend uh, at all times, um, you will find that some of them have quite a bit to say, and uh, and they've got uh, strong opinions that they want you to hear. So yeah, that, that's awesome. <laughs> um, there's a there's a ton of books sprinkled all over the game, many of which you can just sort of open and read. They're often you know a page or a few pages of dialogue. Um, are there any, did you do any writing in those? Are there any that you're particularly proud of or meaningfully to you personally? Is there any? Uh, yeah, I wrote a lot of this. That you, um, recommend that, that uh, you know, as the, as the narrative designer, um, as one of the, one of the narrative designers, uh, I, I uh, uh, wrote a lot of stuff that wasn't dialogue. Um, so uh, a lot of the world setting, um, creating uh, plots, backgrounds, factions, uh, antagonists, uh, and books, um, notes, journals, um, uh, scrawls of blood on the wall, uh, uh, poetry that comes from skulls when you click on them, you know, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, I probably, I mean, everything in, everything is a collaboration. Uh, even, even, even a book, you know, that I, that I wrote, uh, m most of the text for, right. Um, uh, it, it got looked at by an editor. Uh, it got placed on a background by one of our artists. Uh, it got put in the world by one of our, uh, one of our, uh, level designers, um, or set dressers. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, we don't really claim individual credit for much at all in this game. Uh, uh, so I could point to some of the books, you know, in, in Moonrise Towers that I think are particularly dense in their approach to history and stuff. But but that wasn't just me. You know, nothing we do is any just one person. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, that's if you if you ask us uh, individually what what we're proud of, we pretty much usually just dodge that question because okay. we're, proud of, <laughs> we're proud of working with you know, everybody else and the collective experience that we deliver is what's really important. 
yeah, for sure. It, it is it is a, a big team that makes a game like this. So yeah, kudos to, to all of them. Um, let's talk about the blurry ethics in the game. That's something that I found really fascinating. I, I read an analysis somewhere uh, that in the game, like most of the decisions you make, uh, you're going to find it a little difficult to know if you're making the right choice or not. Um, there's just ethical ambiguity all over the place. For example, like, you know, in the first 10 minutes, there's a character whose brain is getting eaten out by an intellect devourer. And then like, do you kill him? Do you try to save him? Like, no, there's like kind of no right answers all, all over the place in this thing. Uh, I thought it made for quite a stunning thoughtfulness to the game. Um, was that all very intentional by you guys? Can you talk about is, the internal discussions that, that went around? Absolutely around intentional because our approach to the story in, in an RPG is that there is no right way. Uh, you know, a lot of games have got a golden path. They've got an optimal choice. They, they, and and uh, if you stray from that, the game kind of nudges you back onto it. And uh, so players learn to look for that and they learn to, to think, you know, I, I, I really need to try to figure out what does the game want me to do here, you know? Um, and a lot of games specifically want you to do you know, that golden path. We don't do that. Um, uh, we, uh, we want you to uh, look at each choice individually, think about what it matters to you, uh, and make it a, make a decision just like you do in real life, you know, with, with imperfect information, uh, and with emotional and, uh, and, uh, uh, material consequences to your decisions. Um, and because, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 is based on Dungeons and Dragons, and that's a tabletop game that you play with your friends around a table, uh, uh, in person. And when you make choices in that situation, um, the dungeon master doesn't tell you, you know, no, that's not the right choice. Um, whatever the players decide to do, uh, the DM rolls with it. The story moves forward things happen. Uh, usually a, a, a D and D session, it's only a matter of time before it goes off the rails, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and goes off in a direction that <laughs> was totally not anticipated, uh, by, by the DM. Um, and that's some of the best stuff that ever happens. Uh, so we wanted that. Uh, so, you know, we deliberately, uh, designed our narratives so that you, no matter what choice you make, whether you think of it as a success or a failure, the story goes forward. Stuff happens uh, as a consequence of that. Interesting stuff happens. Not necessarily the stuff you thought was going to happen, not the stuff you had in mind, but the story proceeds and unfolds before you. And so uh, we, we undertake the challenge of uh, making sure that um, a coherent story unfolds from disaster as well as from triumph. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's no wrong choices. It's just choices. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling that a lot in my playthroughs. One, I, I was maybe a little grumpy one day and, and dove in and was in a fuck it all mood. <laughs> And it, it, like what what seemed like it was about to go off the rails, like just was a more interesting thing that occurred. I ended up in a fight in my camp with my allies. <laughs> I totally didn't expect that, but it's like that kind of stuff's really cool. Uh, yeah, amazing. Um, the one one uh, concept in the game is the the absolute choose. And by the way, I haven't finished yet. No, so no spoilers. I'm I'm late act two right now. Uh, I'm still playing through. Um, but the true souls and, and the absolute, um, I, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, that's a new concept in D and D that's, I, I don't know if that's in any of the published stuff. Anyway, is that something new that you guys came up with? Um, uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure that given the, the long history of, of D and D and the vast quantity of material that has been created in, in many different media for it. I shouldn't be surprised if if that particular approach to to plot hasn't been uh, used before, um, but it was certainly not based on anything that we knew about. Uh, it was uh, uh, based upon um, 
I mean, it all goes back to the Mind Flayer tadpole and everything grows out from that. You know? So um, what what does that lead to? How did that happen? You know, why? Uh, and uh, and what would be interesting? What are the interesting options that could be associated with that? That's where that story grew from. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, there's... And one thing it made me think about too is just just you know fan service versus kind of like keeping fresh and and interesting and new. Like how do you? There's there there's such a wealth of material. I mean we've got you know and and happy anniversary to Dungeons and Dragons. It just hit its fiftieth uh, mm-hmm. birthday. All the gods have been you know well trudged territory. So yeah, I, I was a little just interested in that. How, how where where do you sort of like? you want fan service in there, but I, I think of like in star Wars say where it, it's feeling a little long in the tooth. Cause they're just like, you know, put, put the biggest, most important guys like all over the place. And, and it feels like with the absolute and the true souls, like you guys kind of like are, 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 are paving a new path a little bit. Um, can you talk about that? What, what, what did you guys discuss that internally? Where, where I, I can where... talk about, I can talk about general approach. Certainly. I mean, uh, uh, you know, when you're, when you're making an, uh, a role-playing game, um, you are working in a certain genre, uh, of, of, uh, fiction. Um, and so players come to your game, you know, knowing that, for example, this is a, a, a high fantasy setting, right? Um, players come to your game knowing that they're going to play, uh, a fantasy RPG. And so they, they come to the game with certain expectations, Here's the kind of fun I'm going to have when I play this game. Um, uh, it's an RPG, so here's the kind of characters I'm going to be able to play as. Uh, here are the kind of antagonists I'm going to encounter. Uh, th- those are my expectations coming in. So um, you have to pay off on that, for starters. Uh, you have to uh, give the player what they what they came for. Um, this is the kind of story that they want to be the protagonist in. Uh, they want to, you know, they've... They've seen these kind of stories in every other medium. Maybe they've played uh, tabletop and other video game RPGs, and, and they want to be the heroes now, or at least the protagonists, if not heroes. Yeah. Um, so you, you give that to them, uh, absolutely, uh, no pun intended. Um, and then to make it interesting um, for us and most importantly for the players, then you start to subvert their expectations. Uh, so you have to think, you know, okay, uh, they, they've they gotten this deep into the game and uh, they understand what the situation is They and uh, uh, they understand who they are and uh, and they're starting to build a relationship with their the other members of their party. Now, it's time to start showing them that they're wrong. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that what they thought they understood was only a piece of, of the puzzle. Uh, and that they are going, we're going to give them more pieces to put together. Uh, and as they put those pieces together and the whole thing starts to become clear, uh, it becomes, the players feel like, oh, this is, this is more than I expected. Uh, this is more than I, than I came for. This is, this is actually really cool. Uh, and furthermore, um, I saw this coming together. Uh, I put these pieces together and now I see how they fit. Um, uh, and I am able to master this situation. I'm sure of it. Let's go forward. Uh, uh, and so, you know, um, you've got three acts to do that in. And so you've got, uh, opportunities to keep changing it up and, uh, and adding to cumulatively to what you have, uh, established earlier in the plot and, uh, and their understanding of their characters and of themselves. Um, and as the game goes on, uh, you give them the opportunity to push the story and the characters in the directions that interest them, right? So that the player can make the story their own. Uh, and then the story has to be ready to accept their decisions and give them an appropriate payoff, uh, regardless of what uh, choices the players have made. Um, so yeah, that's our, that's our task. And that's how we, that's how we look at um, uh, genre and the expectations of the players. That's really cool. I, that, that, that makes me think of like, 
you know, especially like, you know, in a tabletop game, I, I find it's, it can be a little boring when, when a player just, just kind of like goes for a straight archetype. Like I'm, I'm a paladin. I'm good. I'm going to do all the good things. One thing I've been asking my players lately to do is to, to come up with a kind of a, a, a dichotomy or, or an arc for their characters too. So like they start here, but they end somewhere else. Like, what is that thing where you're, you're kind of headed towards? And maybe that happens organically in gameplay, or maybe they sort of like set up a little story thing that then I can help, you know, like un, you know, reveal for them over time and the other players. But I think that's, that's more, more interesting than just like, you know, being sort of a one note note thing. And yeah. And all the characters in Baldur's Gate, you know, you, you kind of see that in spades, right? Um, well, yeah, that's what we try to deliver is, uh, you know, a, a, an array of options of people who you get to hang out with and play and get to know and interact with over, uh, you know, a hundred hour game. That That's a, you get to see character arcs left, right, and center, you know, you <laughs> and all your buddies. Yeah. One, uh, one, one dynamic that, that I've, I've kind of found fascinating too is, is, you know, Char versus Saloon, right? There's kind of like the, the, you know, the, the good and the evil, uh, opposites of one another. I, I believe they're sisters in in D and D canon, uh, and it's pretty traditional to play the good guy. Although Baldur's Gate is and and my OD and D game, a lot of players are going for like straight chaos, <laughs> which is making it, things very interesting. Um, but but I found it was it, you know I, I kind of tend to like to play sort of the heroic figure, uh, the the good guy in games. And, and it was, it, it kind of was wonderfully like rolled out where, you know, Shadowheart is one of my players and you, you start to care about her, you're sympathetic with her. And then it starts to roll out why she's a follower of the, the evil <laughs> goddess and, and to do it in a way that made you like sympathetic to it, that it seemed like, okay, well, yeah, I guess that adds up. Cause normally it's like, it, you know, the bad guy is evil and does horrible things, but, but it, it, it was kind of laid out in a much blurrier way than that. And I, and I loved it. Yes. Well, you know, uh, uh, if it, if you don't have characters that, that, um, are understandable in their motives, uh, and, uh, I mean, they just don't feel real. Uh, and they're, uh, and just like real people, you know, if, if they do feel real, they're going to have layers. There's going to be more to them than what's on the surface. And you're going to figure them out from the surface at first. That's because that's all you're presented with. Uh, and then over time you will see beneath the surface. And this is part, one of the reasons why we make atrociously gigantic games, because it takes time to make people real if you don't want them to just be cardboard cutouts. Um, so it takes time to be able to get to know uh, characters and understand, oh, you know, this is, that's how that happened to them. Uh, this is uh, a result of, uh, of, of uh, their, their previous lives, uh, uh, histories, and, uh, uh, and they themselves um, are, are both, uh, empowered and damaged by what has happened before. Um, and as you get to know them uh, and they get to know you, you can, you know, one of the themes of Baldur's Gate 3 is trust. Uh, and so uh, if, if you establish trust, you can start to influence people in a way that might be good, it might be ill, but it's, it's, but it's your choices that, that you're making and the effect of influence that you are having on a person who gives you real feeling and emotion in return. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to me too, like you guys kind of reinforce that concept almost kind of literally with, with UI elements, right? Like as you do stuff, you see this person approves and disproves. So, so in your head, it's kind of like um, putting you in a position of, of almost tracking a little bit, like, like how off the rails you're going with one of the NPCs or driving them away or, or pulling them in. That is uh, that's pretty cool. 
Um, talking, thinking about, um, you started your career uh, in in Dungeons and Dragons, and then spent a long chunk of it in in video game development. Um, and and now here you are, the sort of culmination of of uh, both of those together. Now, uh, another a Dungeons and Dragons video game. Yep, unexpected. Uh, didn't didn't see it coming. <laughs> How, do, how, do, how does that feel? That's that's pretty that's pretty awesome. You're sort of back to square one in a way. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Well, um, in a way, I mean, uh, the thing is that um, I've spent most of my forty years in plus in video games, you know, uh, wishing for the ability uh, to be able to replicate the tabletop experience. Um, and, uh, it is only very recently, uh, that we are able to deliver on that. Um, and, uh, and once again, it's not because we've got magic or anything. It's, it's because incrementally we're able, able to layer many more, uh, levels of, of detail. Uh, than was was previously possible, so that we can we can approach um, the feeling of interacting with with another human being, um, and uh, you know uh, that's one of the reasons why Larian went so hard on the uh, uh, not just voice acting but but facial motion capture and uh, and dynamic. Uh, dialogue animation, uh, because what we had previously, you know, for, for decades, uh, was little guys talking to you on the screen, right? Yeah. It's just, <laughs> a little head. <laughs> you can, you can see them from the top, you know, and look, look he's got a big story swinging around and it's just not, it doesn't feel like a person. Uh, and now we can finally, uh, go back and forth between, um, really fun combat uh, and uh, and speaking to people um, as if they're people, and uh, and it gives an emotional depth to the experience that we couldn't previously get. I mean, uh, there's there's always there's been good writing, you know, in RPGs uh, for a long time, going back to you know Baldur's Gate one and two, for example, set set a standard. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, followed up by things like, uh, uh, you know, Morrowind and uh, Fallout New Vegas and uh, uh, Dragon Age Origins. And, uh, uh, you know, th these games all had really good RPG writing and choices. Um, and, uh, uh, but there was, you know, the human animations were, were, were kind of cranky and it, yeah. it took a while to, <laughs> Uh, to get to a point where you could not be thinking about the fact that this guy's eyes are looking in two different directions while you're talking to him. Um, uh, and instead just focus on what you're hearing and feeling as you talk to this person. Uh, and so I, you know, we finally crossed that threshold uh, and it, it, you know, it feels really good uh, for us uh, to be able to deliver that because um the players connect with it. Uh, and it, it, you know, combat games, fighting, resource management, all that stuff is fun. Emotional engagement is what players remember. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so, you know, you gotta hit them in the heart. Uh, that's what we aim for. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and I think of like, you know, Lizelle and Astarion in particular were just such outstanding characters and their motivations and their flaws and yeah they're they're pretty amazing you you mentioned um sort of wanting to in in video game form recreate that experience uh from tabletop games is, is there can you think of anything that's like the 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 delta that might still be there what are there things that you're like oh, i wish we could you know do do this if we're still not able to yet um uh, I mean, um, absolutely, you know, we, we need to be able to, <laughs> for, for all of the, of the various options that we're able to provide in Baldur's Gate 3, uh, 
there should be more. Yeah. <laughs> there should be more. Uh, and and it should uh, – so there there needs to be a way whereby uh, it can uh, – you can del- we can deliver more in a – in an economical fashion, uh, that is. So, so you know, obviously, everybody is doing this. Everybody's looking at uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, increasing the uh, technological uh, uh, detail and uh, uh, sheer quantity of, of information that's delivered uh, in, a, in an interaction. The, uh, the fidelity that you get, like, you know, you and I are talking right now, and we are making lots of little minor uh, uh, facial expressions that convey all sorts of nuance. Um, and uh, we got a lot of that into Baldur's Gate 3, but there's more to be done. Uh, and there's more to be done with, uh, with physicality. Uh, and there's, there's more to be done um, with, uh, with character choice and options and depth of variation there uh, because um, we, we want to be able to deliver on, we want to be able to deliver the scene that the player just imagined in their head was coming next. Uh, so, yeah. um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not going to talk about, um, uh, stuff that is being uh, researched and stuff, but Larian is an ambitious studio, uh, and it is made up of literally hundreds of uh, RPG fanatics. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, they're 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 crazy about this stuff. We all yeah. are, and <laughs> uh, and so we are. Uh, about, you know, we, we're just going to keep making the kinds of game we games we make, and we're bound and determined to to make them better. Uh, so that's. Uh, uh, I hope I'm I haven't rambled too far off the. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, here, here's one. Uh, I don't know if this is a question necessarily, just an observation in the game that that I really appreciated. I um, one thing from a visual standpoint that that was all over the place was how the edge of the map was handled uh you know normally in video games you're you're you know you're constrained to an area and Baldur's Gate's no different than that but um there, it always felt like whenever you're on sort of the border of something you're like oh I like oh it's right out of my you know range or reach but I, I could go right over there and there's always like maybe a little doorway or something and and this may be a dumb analogy, but I remember the Gummy Bears cartoon as I was a kid did a bunch of that. They always like implied like all this other stuff that was right behind that door that you couldn't get through. And and I think it just kind of like opens your imagination to, you know, just picturing like what's all the stuff that, that keeps going. It's I think it's a little kind of a world building trick to just imply the so much more that's out there. And uh, I thought you guys did a really killer job of that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, just, you know, one of the one of the tricks to that is to make sure that the parts that you can get to um, are, are full of stuff to interact with, uh, because that implies that the rest of the world is the same way. You know, so you don't want to you don't want to have people come into a room and look around and there's, you know, three things that highlight and that's it that's all you got so you can pick up that book and you can you can light that that lamp on the wall and that's it otherwise go through that door and you know that it just doesn't feel like a world uh, so so you know uh, density is important uh, in the areas that you can get to um, so yeah it's a you know sheer quantity of uh, of interaction and and then you don't feel like because, uh, you know, a game where you can only interact with three things in the room, it feels mandatory to interact with those three things. Uh, uh, don't want that. Uh, you don't want anything to be mandatory. Um, so you got to give a plethora of things that can be interacted with so the player can feel like, oh, yeah, I can interact with anything or not. Uh, and then they can just choose not. And that's fine. Um, that It feels like uh, uh, they're not in a, uh, you know, 
an escape room or something where uh, you can tell what's significant and what isn't. Yeah, yeah. And I and I feel, found myself spending plenty of time checking every jar. <laughs> and there's enough delivery, <laughs> like there's enough payoff when you do that. It's like a rotten, I don't care, I'm taking all the rotten stuff. They'll, they'll, they'll buy it back for a gold, whatever. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, like that, the impulse for me is to yes, do it. <laughs> um, let's go. Let's go back uh, in time a little bit to to your Dungeons and Dragons days uh, at TSR. Um, I'm going to show. Uh, so so one of the modules that you worked on. This is the ninth module put out by TSR. This is White Plume Mountain uh, S2. Uh, I got a couple questions about it specifically. Um, I want to show another little thing that I made. Um, this is a a publishing timeline, a TSR Dungeons and Dragons publishing interactive timeline thing. So we see, you know, here in the '70s, uh, this lane is some of the early modules, and here is White Plume Mountain with the original monochrome cover. Um, and I was just sort of reading through it right before this, and I had a few questions. My my my. Saturday group is is running through. Um, we're about a year and a half in. We're playing. Um, we're just finishing up uh, Caverns of Thracia by Janelle Jaquez, and then we're going to start going down the G series. And so probably later this year, we're going to do White Plume Mountain. Um, a couple questions came up. Uh, there's some there's some fun things in here. There is a globe room uh, which has a bunch of fake keys in it. Uh, one of them is uh, comes with a ring. That gives you invisibility, haste, eight charges, uh, acts as a ring of protection plus one, just a whole bunch of benefits. But then the the trick is that it's kind of a to mess with the players to see who will fight over. And as soon as the ring leaves the room, um, it it no longer works. But the trade off there's a there's a, there's a negative to the upside. It, you lose one hit point per year um, when you leave the room. Uh, but but. The ring loses all its powers when you leave the room. Uh, is is the ring supposed? I wondered if the ring is supposed to still do the negative effect after you leave, or just everything's gone. So, <laughs> David, yes, I want you to consider. <laughs> this was nineteen seventy nine. Nineteen seventy nine, and the the sheer quantity of uh, RPG scenarios uh, that I have have worked on since then. And then you want to ask me about one <laughs> item that was in one room <laughs> in, in, uh, uh, in, in one scenario, um, uh, you know, uh, 45 years ago. Uh, uh, so um, you, you've seen, you know, Fellowship of the Ring. I just watched it again last with this week, right? You know, that scene where they're in Maria um, and uh, uh Gandalf is leading the way and he gets to a place where there's three different exits and, uh, and he looks around and he says, I have no memory of this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> it, it was long ago. Give me a big pointy um, hat, right? I have no memory of that. <laughs> For sure. Um, there were some really cool magical items in it. Uh, t talk about your, your, your translating uh, a couple of uh, a series of important books right now. Can you want to talk about that for a moment? Oh, well, um, I, sure. Uh, uh, I have got side projects. I, like I mentioned earlier, I write books, um, uh, mostly under the name of Lawrence Ellsworth. Uh, and uh, uh, I had a really big project for the last 10 years. I've been um, translating new contemporary English versions of all of uh, Alexandre Dumas' Musketeers novels, uh, from The Three Musketeers on to The Man in the Iron Mask, which I just completed uh, like last month. Um, so, uh, you know, that's like a million and a half words of uh, French translation. Um, and it was fun all the way to the end. And boy, am I glad it's done. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so I do that. Um, I also write about swordplay and Swashbuckling movies in the Cinema of Swords series. I've got swash. I've got sub stacks with weekly posts on both of those things. Um, uh, you know, go to my website uh, swashbucklingadventure.net, and it will it will tell you all about all about that stuff. Um, 
so uh, but uh uh yeah I, I i you know one of the ways that i keep interested in working on rpgs every day uh on a day job uh, well after most of my peers have retired um is that i go home at night and write something different uh and then uh, every every morning i come in and i'm fresh so because I, I i did i did a different thing in the evening and i didn't burn out um so uh that's uh that's the idea behind uh keeping many different irons in the fire um you, it's uh you, important to maintain your your sharpness and edge uh because you uh you don't want to get into into repeating yourself now one thing to consider about role playing games is uh, as we said they're 50 years old um, but the other thing about that is that they're only 50 years old uh, it's an art form that is essentially new and uh, we're still making it up as we go along uh, it's not set in stone it's not like everybody has solved all the all the artistic issues of, of role-playing games far far from it um one of the reasons why i i, I have uh e even recently in my career moved from from thing to thing uh is uh because there's still so much to do uh, and there's so much new ground to break uh and uh you know uh uh it uh, it's really bracing and invigorating to be doing it among so many hundreds of other uh, people who are all pushing at the same envelope at the same time uh, as we are at Larian. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a collective design environment that I have never seen the like of uh, in, you know, in, in all my previous, uh, uh, I mean, this is like, like a 12th studio, you know, and uh, I've never seen anything like this. Um, uh, everybody's engaged. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I think the results speak for themselves, I guess. I think they do. And, uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Lawrence Schick, thank you so much for coming on Architects of Imagination. My pleasure. Absolutely. Um, before we go... <laughs> Last thing, thanks to uh, our executive producer, Martika Barra, and the whole Architects of Imagination team. Um, I'll put links in the description to this video of my D&D &D live streams. I've got a D&D &D, uh, YouTube channel as well, <laughs> where I live stream my OD&D &D games. Um, and until next time, can't see what, uh, what you guys are coming up with for DLC for the game and, and whatever's next. Uh, well, you know, we're as eager to see it as you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care, right. Lawrence. Thanks a lot, David. Yep. Bye, all.